So this panel really is focused around uh, the women consumer, the woman consumer in India, uh, the evolution of this um, of this consumer group, and the reason we actually focus this is we have a, a good bias towards investing in, in companies that are uh, catering to the to women, and I have uh, entrepreneurs who have built uh, successful companies uh, and are building success, successful companies in that field. Uh, but it's to really understand how that consumer behavior is, has evolved, why it's actually important today, and what can we hope to learn from, uh, from the experience of uh, folks on the panel here. So I'll just go around with quick introductions. Um, to my left is uh, Priyanka Gill, who is the founder and chief editor of PopExo. Uh, PopExo is the largest digital media and content platform uh, for women uh, in India, um, with access to over 4 million women each month. Um, Next is, we have uh, Richa Kaur, who is the founder and CEO of Zivame. Zivame, as all of you will know, is the, the largest online retailer of lingerie and innerwear products. Um, and you know, Richa has obviously built the company over the last four or five years into a very successful platform. Um, sitting next to her is, is Shreya Mishra, who is the founder and CEO of Flyrobe. Flyrobe represents actually our most recent investment, something which we closed just a few days back. So glad to have you join the IDG family, uh, Shreya. Uh, and Flyrobe is the largest rental platform for fashion products across India today, uh, largely focusing on women, but will be expanding to men as well. And uh, lastly, we have Anubhav Goel from Zimber. And Zimber is, is the largest on-demand home service and handyman services uh, platform in India. Again, largely focused on women consumers and uh, also rapidly expanding on the beauty services side. So guys, thank you again for, for joining me on the panel. You know, as, as we probably know, but some of these statistics are actually useful to, to reiterate, um, women probably form about 20% of the digital population in India today. So as Rajan was saying, you have 300 million internet users. Of that, no more than 50 to 60, 50 to 60 million would be women. But that group of people is expected to go to 200 to maybe 250 million in the next uh, five years. But the reason why that number is actually important is women tend to spend a lot more time as a group, as individuals, as communities, uh, more, much more engaged, uh, spending time online, buying products online, and being far more loyal uh, than, than their male counterparts. And this is across product categories. And the idea was to really try and understand what drives um, you know, this consumer behavior on part of, on part of women. So um, you know, Richa, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, I think. One of the first problems that you were able to overcome very early on, uh, and we saw this as being investors in the company, was, again, the trust deficit, and then the trust issue, and getting women to actually come on and buy products, and you know, not easy products to buy online. Uh, how did you guys go about uh, you know, crossing that milestone? So when we started, um, we knew that we were changing the consumer buying behavior that has been um, uh, so to say, driven through many years of experience of buying the category um, in the offline space. And the first thing that we said is that when if you're changing the buying behavior in terms of the channel in which she'll be experiencing our products, let's try and give her um, some sort of confidence with brands that she's already aware of and say that, you know, these are the brands, but you would have not found so much of variety, so many sizes, so many options um, before in your store. So we will give you range and assortment in the brands that you're already aware of. So that was the first point of, you know, uh, reducing the friction point. So we listed a list, you know, made a list of all the friction points that the consumer would have and started attacking them. And over time, um, we have realized that consumers have come with different things. They've said that, listen, I like your brand, I like your product, but um, I want touch and feel. And um, that's where we forayed into our omni-channel expansion, where we are opening stores for consumers to come, get fitted, touch and feel our products, get um, satisfied with the quality of products that we have, and place an order online. And um, again, Richard, touching the point that we did in the previous panel, right, around creating your own brands. Again, when, when you guys started out, it was looking at third-party brands. but. Over time, there have been some very dominant and successful brands that Zivame has been able to build out. Um, so what's led, again, what led you guys to that strategy? Was it consumer-led or was it more by design? And you know, do you see yourself becoming more of a brand play going forward? 
yeah, so I think um, it's, it's always consumer-led, right? Um, doing private label is uh, just tactically about economics of saying that I'll have a better margin, but it's also about saying, can I fill in the gaps in the assortment where um, we definitely believe that the choice that was available to consumer in terms of sizes, in terms of styles, were very, very limited because of supply chain um, constraints and as well as distribution, the way the distribution happens in this category. It's a very long tail category. So most people didn't get, let's say, for example, um, curvy women, right? Sizes which would extend uh, beyond a D cup. We have close to 120 sizes in bras itself, right? And that's the first of its kind in India itself. And uh, we made the long tail the fat tail uh, with our um, with our private label, right? So that is where we found we opened out new markets with our private label, and over time now our brands, um, in fact, now we have become a full-fledged brand, and all our uh, products that we uh, sell are actually designed and uh, manufactured by us. So everything is now under the brand name of Zivami. Great. Um, switching gears, so Priyanka, when. When we first met, um, you know, you and, and um, uh, your co-founder, I think what amazed us was there were actually at that point close to two million women that you guys were getting, and um, that itself was a bit of an eye opener for us. So we didn't know that there already existed a community um, of very engaged and um, consumption-heavy, um, um, you know, women that were engaging with each other and with with the PopExo brand and sorry, PopExo platform. Um, and I know largely the audience is focused between 18 to 25, 26. So it is the, it is the millennials um, and it is the younger generation. But despite that, you know, what, what is it about the behavior of consumers, what they're consuming, what they're talking about? What is it that's amazed you? Um, and, you know, the team, which I know is largely girls today, right? Um, but w what is it that's pleasantly surprised you in terms of what's happening not on the ground, but in, in the digital sense. Yeah, so uh, when we met IDJ, that was a year ago, we were 2 million, and now we reach around 4 million people a month, or 4 million girls a month, rather. And uh, we basically write and produce content, right? So we do stories, we do videos, pretty much everything that this young 18 to 34-year-old 18 girl is thinking right now, we are thinking about it, and we are producing content for her. So it could be anything from fashion to beauty to hair to sex to relationships to makeup, uh, what she should wear to work. Uh, some of our most popular stories are lingerie stories. She has lots and lots of questions around that as well. So we've been doing this for a while. And over time, uh, we obviously have lots and lots of data points as to what she likes, what she cares about, and uh, what she's interested in. So actually, I get asked this pretty much every time uh, we speak. So hair, actually. So the most popular category that we have is hair. And uh, we realize, I see a, a couple of smiles in the girls in the audience back there. And it's because uh, hair is not sizist. Hair doesn't matter if you're thin, if you're fat, if what your size is. You don't have to be skinny to have great hair. So hair stories do really, really well for us. And uh, that is our, kind of our top categories. Fashion as a whole doesn't really work very well, actually. So I, mean, I can actually say, that Indian girls don't really care that much about fashion. They care about looking good, but they don't want to spend too much money. They don't care about trends as such. They want to feel good. They want to feel comfortable. So then it's not really that much of a trend-led audience as a general. So those are like insights that we've had over time because we write and produce so much content, and we get so much data back from the users to what kind of stories are working and what are not working. So uh, Flyro, for example, is fantastic because it's giving them style at a very low cost. So that's something that actually is going to work as well. So yeah, so it's been, it's been an interesting journey. And um, they're mobile first. I mean, they only care about their mobile phone. Their entire life is their mobile phone. And you, every customer, uh, every brand that's out there today, if you want to reach women, women online, young people online, you have to be on their mobile phone. And that's why PopExo works, because we are where they are. We are on their phones. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. Wherever the audience is, we are there talking to them. Which, which leads us very well into the, to the next question. So, Shreya, I think one of you know, the things which we loved about what you guys are doing, now, rental of fashion, and I don't want to say fashion, but rental of apparel and jewelry has been around in India for years, right? You, uh, many, many wedding industries are built around just that uh, one aspect. But 
you know, you guys have gone much above and beyond that. And part of it is to what Priyanka is saying, right? Which is people are, people being women are looking at uh, affordable fashion, comfortable fashion, and not at high prices, which means they may not necessarily want to own them. And the whole concept of the shared economy is, is, is much more prevalent with the, uh, with the younger generation. But again, you guys have expanded the gamut, right? You're not just looking at ethnic, you're looking at Western wear. So what is it about the proposition that works well? And um, you know, where, do you see, you know, where do you see that growth coming in, in the future from? So uh, when we started Flyrobe, uh, and you know, we're uh, about to complete uh, 12 months now, uh, the one question that almost everybody used to ask us was that, I get, I get ethnic wear, I get people don't want to spend 30,000 rupees on a Ritu Kumar sari. It makes complete sense. People send, spend lakhs on buying their wedding wear. It makes complete sense. Like, if this option exists, everybody would just jump onto it. Um, and then there were some consumers, while we were researching the idea, there were some consumers that told us, hey, what if, if I were going to a party, I could just book a dress uh, based on what I wanted to wear? And it literally started as an experiment completely in the dark, where we said, okay, uh, me and my co-founders, uh, we pulled in, I think, uh, all our personal savings. We bought 100 clothes, and we started a WordPress website, like quick and dirty. In 15 days, we set that up. Uh, there were 100 clothes, um, and uh, we had no marketing money left, and we said, okay, let's try. Let's see if women bite into it. And it was amazing. Uh, you know, in the first week itself, we saw like some 30 orders flowing in, we, and all we had done was like some influencer marketing, and I'll, you know, we can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, what we realized was that pe people are really biting into this, and you know, uh, I can now say a lot of things in, uh, in hindsight. Uh, of course, there was a lot of thinking going into it as well. Uh, but I think the one thing that if you see in fashion, right, what, why is, where is the fashion growth coming from? It's all about fast fashion, right? Everybody's talking fast fashion. Uh, all these online websites are creating their own brands, uh, giving people access to affordable fashion, to you know, great styles, to more, uh, to better trends. And the fight always is about how do, I, how do I get the next collection out the fastest way, right? Zara has set that, uh, set that tone for all other brands. Like, Fastest, how can you replenish your collection? Because people are just wanting more. So the one aspect that we realized uh, was that aspiration, in, and fashion is an aspirational category, but aspiration works two ways, unlike in a category like car or a home. I just want a better brand of car. I just want a better brand of home. But interestingly, in fashion, I just don't want a better brand. I also want more variety. And we realized that the aspiration on variety is much higher than the aspiration on brand. And exactly as Priyanka said, I want to look good. I just want more fashion. And that was on the one hand uh, that people want more fashion, but on the other hand, women are constantly sort of getting bored of their wardrobe. They are constantly saying, hey, I have nothing to wear today. Um, and you know that problem, uh, believe it or not, is really acute because of social media. Uh, women uh, earlier were wearing, let's say, a dress uh, and in one friend group, and they could repeat the dress in another friend group, but not anymore, because it's up there on Instagram, it's up there on Facebook. And women just don't like to repeat. So you know, this really has come out like this great wardrobe hack for women, uh, wherein, uh, you know, I mean, the women here can say the joy of getting a new dress. So if a woman was getting that joy 10 times in a, in a year, uh, with Flyrop, she can now get it 100 times, because she's only paying 10% of the cost to, we've really made this paper use. Uh, and, and you know, that's just sort of the, of course, that's, a, that's sort of the excitement aspect of it, but obviously there has to be an economic proposition too. So women, while they're doing that, they're actually also saving a lot uh, because they were anyways, you know, not used to repeating their clothes too many times. Anyways, they were buying fashion that they were only wearing a few times. As she said, as long as I'm looking good for my freshers party or as, I'm, as long as I'm looking good for my office event, uh, you know, that's what women really care about. So, yeah. Great. So, Anubhav, as one guy to another on a women-focused panel, let's see how far we get. Um, but, uh, you know, I think what I found very interesting when I was, was talking to you recently was the whole concept of what, uh, largely the concept of what Zimber is offering, on-demand services for the home is, is focused on the woman consumer, right? Um, and clearly, the beauty services is only for women and by women. And, um, but interestingly, the, what you were mentioning was a lot of the bookings that they get done um, are by either their husbands or you know, their friends, et cetera. So given that you're wanting to focus on women at the end of the day, um, and you're you know, giving more and more services around that, what do you feel is the best way to engage with women as a consumer from a transacting point of view? Right? 
because it's not a product, it's really a service delivery. How do you, how do you guys think about that? Oh, thank you so much for uh, uh, this, Karan. Uh, in fact, in the morning today while I was coming, uh, I told my wife that I'm on a panel today, and I'm talking about uh, women as a consumer. Uh, she said, what, what are you going to talk about? I told her that I'm going to talk about, and all of us are going to talk about how a woman thinks. And she said, dude, you have not understood how do I think, how will you go talk about it? But I think the good part with us is that at least we have a massive amount of data uh, which comes us. Um, so at least rather than deciphering one woman, if we try to decipher a lot together, I think the life becomes easier. So the same thing happened with Zimmer as well. Uh, we took a tough task of uh, solving the problem of home services. Uh, the entire TG which we defined on day one around uh, two years ago when we started, we thought that double income, no kids, you know, sort of people will typically come and order. And the entire product uh, on the front end side was prepared like that. And all the technicians and all the service providers whom we call as champs uh, were trained more on uh, uh, hard skills. You know, how do they perform a job you know, when they go to a place. Uh, and we were taking orders on call, web, and app, all, all the channels. So we were getting around orders of around 70% uh, on call, which is not effective at all. Uh, the rate, uh, or the conversion rate on the app was not picking up at all, and uh, the repeat also was not happening then. Uh, and I have this habit of initially, uh, the orders were not very high. So the first three months, I used to go to customers along with my champs. Uh, so that was the time when I gained a lot of insights from them. Even today, there's a three-people team who keep talking to customers and keep getting insights. So what we have now done is we have uh, broken the entire uh, supply chain sorts from the point that a customer comes to our platform. So the entire name of Zimber, where we are trying to make home services more cooler, uh, getting more colors into the brand, uh, so that now people can relate with it. It's not that mundane blue collar job which we do, but it looks like a trendy stuff. Uh, the plumber and competition who shows up, or a beautician who shows up are called Divas and, and Champs. They come in a, a good uniform, a good t-shirt the way they greet. So we realized that the entire front-end product has to be much more uh, guys-oriented, which even if it doesn't have a lot of content, but the order booking process has to be very fast because you know, they don't have, generally don't have time and they just want to book the order and let it be. And after that, when a champ goes to a house, now how he behaves? Now very small things like if the door is open, you still knock and say, you know, ma'am, I'm from Zimba, this is my eye card, can I come in? The moment the guy says it, it builds a lot of trust. Because we realize that if we are really able to satisfy uh, the woman at home, uh, that's the time when we will be able to get the entire wallet share of the home services. And you won't believe, actually, the third largest spend which we do annually on our, in our houses is on home services. So the whole idea was that if I can capture a woman uh, through something uh, you know, which is, she's really looking at, like that's how we launched Salon. Like a lot of uh, ladies said that you are anyway doing so much of stuff, then why don't you do Salon? And again, it was an uh, iterative process. When we launched Salon, we thought we will pamper women at home, and we started giving all those services to them. Eventually, we realized that that's not what they are looking at. If they really want to get pampered, they want to go to a salon or a spa and get pampered there. The only three or four major things which they want to do at home, uh, which are more cyclical in nature. So if it is a waxing, or if it is a facial, or a cleanup, or if it's a massages which they have to do, that's what they want to do at home, which really, really helped us a lot, because now I can really, really scale up. Uh, I don't have to plan for those, you know, so many 30, 40 odd services which a woman would want to do. I will just do three or four and do a fab job there. And, and that's where the, you know, kicker comes. So, so, so that's how we have been able to decipher. So the front end is made majorly for, uh, you know, male targeted population and the entire back end uh, and the service delivery and the entire upselling and cross selling, uh, we target women. Yeah. And did you guys have to, or are you guys doing any sort of uh, offline initiatives to engage with you know the audience, whether it's at uh, you know communities or buildings or complexes in in, in Bombay, uh, to get a the awareness, b you know activations and c retention, so that people can actually engage with the brand. Yeah, of course. So uh, we institutionalized uh, uh, the service department activation camps. We call it Zimber Spot. Uh, so Zimber Spot became viral, uh, uh, you know, in Mumbai. We started actually getting a lot of inbound interest from uh, apartments. So we do these pamper parties where, you know, these kitty parties will happen and my divas go there. And, you know, we do pedicure, you know, at one shot. We do manicures at one shot because pedi is something which, you know, every woman have to do, you know, every month or so. And it's, it's a quick activity. So we call it Zimber Spot. Uh, I think at scale, we did uh, 1,000 spots in a month. 
uh, which was very massive because I could reach to so many societies at one shot. And today, actually, Zimber is the largest company in Mumbai in the home services space. And uh, in Gurgaon, we are the largest now. So, so th the whole uh, penetration which happened uh, you know, by reaching out to women directly uh, through the offline channels really, really worked well for us. In fact, uh, uh, we have a lot of influencers in multiple groups uh, and who keep influencing because we realize that when women is coming, uh, to our platform, they would want to see whether somebody else has used us or not. So that becomes a very, very huge influencing factor uh, for us. So we use that uh, as a big, big channel for us as yeah, well. Actually, that's one thing we've seen, um, you know, in in all all com on the companies here as well as in First Cry and, and some other companies which are largely focused on women, is the role of influencers. Um, and I think each each of you guys could probably talk about that. But you know, Priyanka on. Two points. I think one is on the role of influencers, whether it's a blogger community um, or you know your own writers, and also some of the offline initiatives you're doing with with college campuses, because those are really targeting women who may or may not come online today. Obviously, the bloggers are, but but the offline is is not. But how does that all come together in terms of creating a integrated community of uh, influencers? So when you're talking influencers, right? So PopExo itself is a large uh, influencer platform in a way. We have India's uh, 200 of India's top bloggers who are PopExo bloggers who work with us. Brands love bloggers, so we work a lot with brands to kind of connect bloggers and uh, to get them to talk about uh, brands who are paying us for it. Uh, we also run uh, 1,900 uh, campus ambassadors all over India in 175 uh, cities in uh, uh, 175 campuses, right? So these are girls who love PopExo, the brand. They really kind of think PopExo is for them. PopExo is actually by them as well now. And they're PopExo girls who kind of just love what we do, who share what we do. And we give them tasks to do on a weekly basis, and we engage, we kind of keep them engaged. And then they become our evangelists. So if, um, we have a pop girl who's a PopExo ambassador. She'll have a PopExo squad around her of five girls who then kind of become PopExo on campus. And if they're doing anything that where PopExo could help or amplify, then we do it for them. So all this just becomes a large way of building a brand in today's day and age. So I mean, one of the most powerful things that we've done is that we've made PopExo matter to our demographic in a way that the kind of reviews that we get uh, on the App Store, I mean, I mean they, they actually do make our day. You are the girly Google. You know what's on my mind. I mean, you're my best friend. So to kind of have that connect with your audience and where they think of you as something so important in their lives, that is partly because we've been very successful in building these large offline communities of girls. We go to the city, we'll organize a mini fest, we'll get three, four, five hundred of them together, we'll go to their colleges, we'll talk to them about entrepreneurship, we'll talk to them about being female leaders, and uh, they absolutely love that. So we do a lot of kind of physical engagement on the ground to kind of keep PopExo growing and uh, to keep building the brand as well. And that's led to, if I remember correctly, people, you, um, your, the community usage is around close to three hours a month. OK, yeah, so we're talking about community, right? So we, we talk to our girls a lot. And then we really listen to what they have to say. And I think that's been a common thread of all the panelists uh, that have been coming before as well. And so one of them, they're like, listen, we like talking to PopEx. We like PopExo, but we like talking to each other as well. What can you do about that? So we launched PopExo Community as a platform two months ago, which is, again, very similar to uh, what First Cry does. It's close to men. So you have to be female on Facebook to get in. And if you are a man on Facebook and you try and get in, you get no man's land, and then obviously you get kicked out. And if you're an investor on the board, you can't get in. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. and unfortunately, all our investors are men, so they really can't see what awesome things community does unless I show them my phone. So we're going to have to actually solve for that. So yeah, so you get in there, and we let girls ask questions to each other around eight topics. The eighth is random. And uh, last week alone, I don't think you've heard the number current, 75,000 interactions happened on just girls asking each other questions. And uh, each question is getting from seven to nine responses now. So it could be anything, you know, uh, my hair is falling, what do I do? And then suddenly nine girls will say, hey, use this, use that, use this, use that. Uh, one of the other questions I saw the other day was, oh, I want to buy a cheap pair of spectacles. I actually went in there and said, hey, have you tried lens card? And she said, no. So there's, there's a little bit of market research happening there as well. So these girls love talking to each other. They all have problems. They're unsure of each other. They want uh, female affirmation as to what they're doing. And we're seeing this happen at scale, and it will continue to happen. And all because it's a closed community of girls. They can talk whatever else on their mind. And we've never had trolling so far, and we've been live for two months. So it's really amazing to see kind of, it's almost an insight into those young Indian girls' mind that we have. 
And brands love that, as you can imagine. Absolutely. Um, Rija, I remember when you guys had first opened the store in Bangalore, and I know you guys are now expanding the, the store count. There's one right behind my office in Delhi now. Um, it, it led to some unbelievable conversions and the kind of results that you know nobody in, at IDG or anybody else we spoke to had seen anything like that. So why do you think that happened? And please, if you can, share some of those stats. Uh, please do, because those were mind-boggling, to be honest. So I think um, it was mostly because of the experience. So we opened a concept store, the first of its kind, uh, I would say globally at that time, uh, where we were not selling anything from the store. It was like a showroom where you can come in, get yourselves uh, fitted, and our advisors will help build your lingerie wardrobe. We saw um, close to 70% conversion in store and 84% in all conversion, overall conversion, where people would say, okay, I'll buy it online. You know, I may not want to buy it then and there. I don't want to place an order then and there. I think um, uh, the other good thing is we got a lot of word of mouth coming in. You know, digitally, we have not been as, <laughs> as successful as um, PopXO to have so much of influence and people actually talking and saying that, hey, I have brought this stuff from uh, Zivami and why don't you buy, uh, et cetera. Those conversations, I don't think we have uh, successfully um, got from our, cons uh, from our consumers. But when we opened our stores, people were so happy with the experience. They said, now I'll bring my friend along. And um, everybody, 85% of the women were wearing the wrong size. So all those statistics in itself got women to take our brand a lot more seriously. And uh, based on the success of that um, is where we are opening um, a lot more stores in different parts of the country now. Excellent. Um, Shell, last you know, question to you before we open it up for Q&A. Um, Again, you know, the role of influencers, I know a lot of celebrities have been customers of, of Flyro, which has worked very nicely. Um, there are a lot of, you know, very ardent users of the platform. There are very ardent, um, there are a lot of, sorry, pieces of clothing which get used a lot also, right? 17, 18 turns from what I've seen. How does that all come together when you're, you know, activating customers or acquiring customers? And how does it come, how does it work when you're looking at retaining customers, right? Because those are slightly different from what we, one is one seen as, uh, what one is seen as the, in e-commerce. But in rental, it works a bit differently, right? So how, how does that work for you guys? Absolutely. So I think in terms of retention, uh, you know, that's, that's something we focus a lot on. And I think uh, that's the real challenge. If you talk sustainable businesses, there's only one thing to that, whether your customers come back to you or not. Uh, and I think that is something uh, a lot of times solved by product, your customer experience, we obviously focus on that. But uh, to that, the very simple answer to that question is that we think we del this is addictive. We think this is a fashion drug. Once you feel the joy of, oh boss, today I wanted to wear a red dress and I have it in three hours, like wow. Uh, I mean, this is like this new magical power that I didn't know had existed, right? Like. Uh, a classic example to that, uh, one very old and one fairly recent, like before there was Uber, if somebody told you, hey, I'm going to give you an app in your hand, it'll tell you when to expect the car, are you going to pay 1.5x for that? And people will be like, why? But then you have to experience the Uber thing and you realize, oh, I, oh wow, I don't have to stand in the sun. I can be in my bedroom, I can book the car, I can go down my building and then it's there. I don't have to face rejection from 200 auto alas. So uh, all of that, only when your experience happens, you know, um, very similar to like how tea was brought in India. I, I love that example because initially there used to be horse cars that used to distribute tea to people. And uh, people just got addicted and India became the largest consumer of tea, uh, which and th that, that never supposed to happen because, and that's the power of an addictive product. So I think uh, that's, you know, that's the answer to it. We think it's a fashion drug. You get acquired, you keep coming back. Uh, the question of how we use influencers to acquire customers, um, We've been very bullish on that. Uh, and a lot of these kind of innovations actually come from, you know, lack of resources mo uh, mostly. So when we didn't want to spend a lot of marketing dollars, we said, hey, you know, let's try out these bloggers, you know. Uh, a lot of girls seem to be following them. Uh, so we got some of the big bloggers of India, uh, you know, we had to pay them in the beginning, uh, and then they would 
talk about us and then we, whenever we used to speak to customers, they were like, oh yeah, I'd seen your Facebook ad, but yeah, when Santoshi posted about it, that's when I decided to try it. So that's the confirmation women want because as Priyanka said, right, women share, women talk. Uh, they Fashion as a category, like I have never tried a brand unless somebody, some, one of my friends told me, hey, go and try Kooves, hey, go and try Zivame. So I think it just works like that. It's very sisterly and very like, you know, uh, influencer based in its own way. The way we scaled that program, and you know, now there are like more than 3,000 pictures shared on social media tagging Flyrobe. Some of that was seeded by us, but you wouldn't even find uh, that many pictures of Mintra, by the way, on, on, on social media. Uh, and one, obviously, it's part, big part of the nature of the service. That's because when a person gets a new dress, they, they're bound to sort of share it on social media, and they love the fact that we repost that picture. So they'll tag us, uh, saying, hey, thanks, Flyrobe, for the lovely dress. Uh, but this has happened after, you know, conscious efforts, where in the beginning, we reached out to a lot of bloggers. We said, hey, you know, you want to cover latest trends, you want to tell your followers, uh, you know, you want to pull off different styles all the time. Uh, you know, this is your open wardrobe, 15% uh, off, 20% off, uh, based on how many followers you have, and order, and just post about it, just tag us. Uh, and that just got the ball rolling. So, you know, now there are, uh, and, and that was just like, you know, these normal girls with 20,000 Instagram followers, that's our cut. Like 20,000 Instagram followers, if you have, you're, uh, you know, you, you're part of this fly club, as we call it. Uh, and you could be a normal girl. Some of them are not even bloggers. They just happen to have 20,000 followers. And, and uh, you know, 30, 35% of our customers, we ask them on call, where did you hear about us from? They either tell us a friend or a blogger. So, you know, like, uh, that's your, you know, artificially seeded word of mouth that then becomes a rolling thing. Uh, other than that, uh, the side effects of it were that some celebrity stylists used to follow a lot of these bloggers. Once they saw that bloggers were wearing it, they checked out our website, they really liked the stuff. And the first order, uh, you know, there was a 3,000 rupee order in our dashboard and we were like, who ordered so many dresses? So we checked, he was a stylist to Sunny Leone. And uh, we were like, hey, your order is free, can she tag us? And they were, he was like, yeah, sure. Uh, and once that happened, then Radhika Apte happened, then Huma Qureshi happened, recently Parineeti Chopra happened. We've delivered dresses to every Bollywood celebrity, like Shilpa Shetty, Sonam Kapoor, everybody now. So it's just sort of uh, a rolling effect. But yeah, I think influencer marketing is something one has to focus on and really seed. Uh, it's very hard to measure in the beginning. And it doesn't take any money, but it takes a lot of effort to get, you know, we've like li literally reached out to women. Uh, you know, there, there have been like an IIT and in our team who's actually done that in the beginning, like reach out to 100 people every day, uh, purely Instagram DMing, saying, hey, you know, be a part of our club and, you know, try out our service. So, yeah, it's... Excellent. Well, I'd like to just thank all of you guys for taking the time again. Uh, it's, been, it's been real, it's been a fun panel.